friends, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's great to have you here this morning. On this uh, Labor Day weekend, I was driving in this morning. There was no one on the road, but uh, I'm glad to see that uh, many of you have made it here. Uh, to those of you who are uh, online today, welcome. We are thrilled and delighted to have you with us as well. And uh, Dan Orley, nice job with Rodney. Thank you for that. That was great. It's... I've got to ask, how hard is it to play the trumpet at 9.30 in the morning? It seems early. It's hard, isn't it? Get your breath going. Uh, as you can see, it's Communion Sunday, so if you're at home, if you would get your elements together, and uh, prior to Communion, uh, I'll have some language, and I'll give you time to get uh, your minds right, and then we will uh, celebrate that sacrament together. If you don't have your elements yet here in the sanctuary, make sure you go into the narthex or raise your hand, and you will get them. Uh, worship at 11 starts next week, so this is um, the beginning of the fall semester. If you are interested in a service that is a little less formal, a little more intimate and casual, we have that next door in our middle sanctuary at 11 o'clock every Sunday starting this coming week. If you're in the narthex after this service, so this is not for those of you who are uh, online, but those of you who are here, you're going to see the Crestview, quote, geek squad out there, and so they're going to be answering tech questions about our various platforms we use to communicate. So if you have any kind of question whatsoever, if you've got your iPhone with you or your Android, if you've got your tablet with you, if you'll take it out there, they can help you with everything from the website to be on the bulletin to a text in church, all the different ways we communicate. So they would love to have that conversation with you. Uh, speaking of uh, letting us know that you're here, the text in church platform uh, let us know that you're here if you'd like, and if you have a prayer request, please do feel free to share that with us. I know I say it every week, but we do as a staff pray over each person whose name is given to us. Our intercessory prayer team does the very same thing. In fact, if you'd like to be on that, reach out to the church office. And, uh, and we also mention the names here in our, in our service. This morning we're praying for Sandy Becker, who had surgery this past week and she is home now. Uh, Mark Evans, who continues to be a patient at UC downtown, and Carla Sutton, who also had surgery this week, but she is back at Maple Knoll. So if you'd like to add a name to that, uh, you now know how to do it. All right, I think we are ready to worship. I'd like to invite you now to take a deep breath, and let's get our minds centered on the goodness and the love of God, centered on Jesus Christ. And the passage we're praying this morning is Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. And so let's meditate together on God's Word and then lift His Word back to Him in prayer. Will you join me? Our gracious God, as we gather for worship, we thank You for Your Word. And in particular, from the psalmist, we pray, that as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. For He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. For He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Our gracious God, as we bow before You today, we thank You that You understand us, that You know that we are dust, that You remember how You formed us, and yet You love us and forgive us. We thank You for Your amazing compassion, and we pray, Lord, that You will give us the good grace to stand before You or to kneel or bow before You in reverence and in awe. We thank You for Your Son, Jesus Christ. For we know that it is in Him You have given us that compassion. And so we pray now that You prepare our hearts as we worship You. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. Rejoice, heavenly powers. Sing, choir of angels. Exalt all creation around God's throne. Jesus Christ is risen. Sound the trumpet of salvation. Rejoice, heavenly powers. 
Sing, choirs of angels. Jesus Christ is risen. Rejoice, O earth, radiant in the brightness of your King. Glory fills you. In Christ, darkness vanishes forever. Rejoice, heavenly powers. Sing, choirs of angels. Jesus Christ is risen. Rejoice, O church, exult in glory. The risen Savior shines upon you. Let this place resound with joy, echoing the mighty song of all God's people. Rejoice, heavenly powers. Sing, choirs of angels. Jesus Christ is risen. Please stand and join with me in singing Crown Him with Many Crowns.
Thank you again, Dan. Well, in the uh, mid-1850s, the U.S. government sponsored an expedition to head out west to explore that part of our continent and also to open it up for travel. Now, this is about 50 years after Lewis and Clark, and so they found a man named Joseph Ives. In fact, his middle name was Christmas, Joseph Christmas Ives. He was named Christmas. Guess why? He was born on December 25th, right? There we go. And so uh, Ives and his group headed out west. It was a group that consisted of engineers and also members of the military. And as they went out west, some interesting things happened. First of all, they took a steamboat and they assembled it while they were traveling. And they put it in the water at the mouth of the Colorado River. Well, the river was far too violent for that steamboat, and so they scrapped that and they traveled by animal and by foot. Eventually, in 1858, they came to a place that was this vast area. And Joseph said, this is a worthless wasteland. It has no value whatsoever. In fact, he noted, we were probably the first non-Native American Indians to even enter into this part of the country. He said, and we will probably be the last. No one will ever want to go here again. It is profitless. It is a wasteland. It is worthless. And so when he came back and he made that report, of course people believed him and thought no one will ever go there. Well, eventually someone traveled to that same place. And they enjoyed its beauty and they named it the Grand Canyon. No one would ever visit there, right? They were the last non-Native American Indians to go to the Grand Canyon. Well, tell that to five million people who go every year. He made a prediction, and it didn't come true. You know, I love predictions. Every year at the beginning of the year, I love to read people who say, this is what's going to happen in 2022. Or this is what's going to happen in next year, 2023. Punxsutawney Phil is a great predictor, isn't he? Everybody know who Punxsutawney Phil is? So on February the 2nd, every year, the groundhog in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, is brought out. And if he sees his shadow, well, that means six more weeks of winter. If he does not see his shadow, if it's a cloudy day like it is today, then it's going to be an early spring. So he's very reliable, isn't he? Yeah. You know what his success rate is? 39%. I mean, it's a 50-50 chance here we're talking. 1970, a biologist at Harvard University said, within 15 to 30 years, civilization will cease to exist, will be no more. Well, that's 52 years ago, and based on what I'm looking at right now, we are all still here. Over and over again, we see people who make predictions about the future, trying to anticipate it, and often those predictions are wrong. This is going to be news to some of you, but it is the start of football season now. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, I promise not to talk about it. I'm not going to make any promises about talking about football. 
But one of the things that really kind of annoys me about the pregame shows is every time there's a pregame show, you've got this panel of experts and they predict who's going to win. I find that very annoying. Especially toward the end of the year when they show their success rate and most of them get it wrong more than 50% of the time. There are only two teams playing, right? We have this interest in the future. What's it going to be like? How do we predict it? And that's what I want to talk about with you this morning. Because Paul is going to address the most important question we have about the future, and that is, what happens to you and me when we die? That was a question on the minds of many people who were in the early church, especially those in Corinth. And we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, as you know, we're completing a series. We've called it Justified. And we've looked at this great doctrine that in Jesus Christ, God has taken sinful people like you and me, broken apart people, and He has made us right with God by God's grace. And we receive that through faith, right? And today we look at what happens to us when this life ceases because that is how the story of being justified ends. Earlier in the summer, we had someone in here, Greg Kokel, who was talking about the story of reality. And I want to just kind of remind you and frame what we're going to talk about this morning. Remember, God tells one great story. He created this perfect earth, this perfect place, had this perfectly wonderful garden where Adam and Eve, the first two humans, would live. They had perfect communion with God. Everything was wonderful. And then they yielded to God's adversary, And that was original sin. And from that moment on, human beings have been alienated from God. What's God going to do about that? There's nothing we can do because we are flawed, sinful human beings. What is God going to do? Well, ultimately, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, and by His blood, we were reconciled to God. But there was something else that happened. After the crucifixion, Jesus was resurrected. And therefore, the promise is that you and I will be resurrected as well. Paul wanted those first century Christians to understand this. And so he begins in verse 35 of chapter 15 with a really, really important question. Have you ever asked this yourself? But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? How How does it happen? With what kind of body will they come Paul's going to take off from this. I think that's a great question. I think that's on a lot of our minds. Over the years, I have done hundreds of funerals. And each time I have done a funeral, I've tried to address this very question. Because when we stand there and we face the mystery of death, we want to know what's going to happen. And how is it going to happen? In that early church, there were all these different opinions about what happens after we die. In fact, I bet that if we tried to take a poll of this congregation right here, many of us would have different ideas about this important doctrine. You see, there were some from a Hebrew background who were aligned with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees believed that when you and I die, when these bodies cease, that we have a building from God, a house not made with human hands, that is eternal in heaven. They believed in the resurrection of the body. On the other hand, there were the Sadducees, You're familiar with the Sadducees. They maintain that when it's over here, it's over. So you had both of those viewpoints in the church. And then you had these Greeks in the church. Of course, they're in Corinth. And they had a wide array of opinions. There were some Greeks who believed, yes, when we die, something does happen. We're not exactly sure what. But we probably go to this place and we have this kind of spirit life that we live. There were other Greeks, they were called Epicureans, they followed a man named Epicurus, who basically said life is just about pleasure and luxury, so eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you may die, and when you die, it's over. All these different opinions were swirling around the church. And I have to confess that as I get older, I think about it myself too, don't you? I mean, I remember when I was a young pastor, I would go visit folks in the hospital, and they would always talk about their ailments. Of course, they're in the hospital. What else are they going to talk about? But I would listen to people talk about over and over their ailments and their hip replacements and their knee replacements and their heart problems, and I would think, how boring to talk about your ailments all the time. I mean, who does that? 
Occasionally I'd be in the hospital and someone would show me their scar. I'm not going to say anything else about that. But you can imagine what a 26-year-old was thinking, looking at all these different scars. Y'all, I'm 57 years old now. Guess what my friends and I talk about? Our ailments. My back hurts. I have vertigo now. We have all these different things that we're dealing with. We know that these bodies we live in are degrading. And we know that as soon as we are born, the process of dying begins. And they knew that in the Corinthian church as well. And so they said, you know what? We see people within the body, they're passing away already. What's going to happen to them? I think you and I sometimes wonder the very same thing. Paul undertakes this conversation. Verses 42 through 44. Here you go. So as I read this, let's think about these two things. You've got the now and the not yet. You've got the present and you've got the future, okay? So just bear that in mind as we go through this. He's talking about what's true for right now and what will be true in the not yet. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So what's true about the, the right now? What's true about the present? Let's just look at it. It is perishable. These bodies we live in, they don't last forever. That is the design since the fall of humanity. That these bodies are again decaying and degrading. Aren't you glad you're here this morning? So they're decaying and degrading. We all know it's true. This is the great thing about worship. We just get real. It is sown in dishonor. Again, we are broken, fallible, fallen human beings. We are since original sin. It's just the reality that we live with. Every morning when we get up and we look in the mirror, we see our brokenness. I mean, I've seen cartoons where people will say, you know, I have not committed a single sin all day. I guess it's time to get out of bed. You know, as soon as we get out of bed, there you go, right? So our bodies are sown in dishonor. They are weak. We know that our strength is limited. And the older we get, the more aware we become of it. When I walk into that gym and I look at that basketball goal at 10 feet, I think there was a time in college I could take a ball and I could dunk it. I would be lucky to even see the rim now with my eyes the way they are, you know? We bodies are weak. And then finally, what else? We have a natural body. In other words, what we have physically right here, the elements inside these bodies, they're basically the same elements in your front yard. We know these bodies need a mix of nitrogen and oxygen to exist. They are natural bodies. That is the reality that we live with. And so those first century Corinthians are saying, okay, I'm getting a picture now. There is a present, but then there is also a future. So let's look at the text. What is the future? Now let's go back. What is the future? These bodies are imperishable. Someday you and I will have a body that lasts forever. Can't tell you exactly what it is, how it's going to look, but we know there will come a day when we will inherit something that lasts forever. They will be in glory, not in dishonor. In other words, you and I, someday, we're not going to be broken and sinful people. That day is over. We're going to be different human beings. We're going to have power. We're not going to run out of gas. We're not going to be tired all the time. We're going to have constant power. And then finally, our bodies will be spiritual. We are not going to be limited as we are limited today. Our bodies are not going to have the same elements that are found in our front yard. We're probably not going to need a certain mix of oxygen and nitrogen in order to live because our bodies are no longer natural, they are spiritual. All right, so let's just kind of digest that for a minute and think about it. The now and the not yet. And let me just back away and ask you a question and think about it. Have you ever in your life been yourself or known someone who was tempted to turn away from God, turn away from walking with Him because they or you or I were expecting the not yet today. 
expecting God to give us all these wonderful things today in these bodies. All those things to happen in the present. They don't. We live in a natural body sown in dishonor. I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, so-and-so got sick, there is no God. Process, think about that. We live in a natural body. My grandmother passed away, there is no God. I, I'm, I'm not going to walk with God because my grandmother passed away. These bodies, again, are limited. They are mortal. Sometimes we think, I want God to make me immortal, imperishable, and strong and powerful and spiritual right now. And we get frustrated because God does not. And if God does not, which He doesn't, we wonder if He really exists. So Paul is taking, again, remember the context. He's taking that first century church and they're thinking, okay, people are getting sick and people are dying. Why should I have faith? And he's reminding them there is a not yet that's still about to come. These bodies are decaying. I remember when I was 26 years old, I uh, had cholesterol that was 312. That's really high. And that's been something I've battled my whole life. I'm adopted. There's no family history, so I just had high cholesterol. So my whole life, I've been in a catch-22. I've got this cholesterol that's 312, and yet the statins I take make me feel terrible and make me tired, and they're not good for my liver. What do I do? We all are facing the very same dilemma. And God basically says, I'm not going to give you a false promise. I'm not going to tell you that everything is going to be hunky-dory in a rose garden today. Nope. But then what he says is here, but think about this. You have a new body waiting for you. All the decay, all the problems, all the brokenness, one day it's all going to go away. Think about, let's make a connection here. Think about Jesus' resurrected body. His resurrected body represents an illustration and an example of your resurrected body and mine. So that's a leap there. We look at his resurrection and we think, okay, that's wonderful. What the New Testament wants us to understand is the same is going to happen for you and the same is going to happen for me. So what do we know about his resurrected body? What does it look like? Well, first of all, people recognized him. And so there will be distinguishing characteristics we're all going to have. He was able to eat. And so he had those physical things he was able to do. He was able to communicate with people. And so one day we are going to be in a place, we're going to have this new body, and we, and we can communicate with one another. He was not limited by his injuries in any way. Completely powerful. He was not limited by time and space. He could move about in ways that no one else could. Think about that for your future and for mine. That's what God says awaits you and me when this now passes away and the not yet comes. That's what we get to inherit. I was trying to think of different ways we could think about that. And uh, it's interesting, when, when, I, when I write these notes, I do a focus group of you. And so I keep about ten of you in mind and think, okay, how is so-and-so going to hear this? Because we're all so different different ages from different parts of the country, different life experiences. We all are at different points in our Christian journey. We have people who worship with us every week for whom English is not their first language. That changes the way I communicate, right? And so think about it in these terms as I was looking at this focus group trying to think of how can I describe this, fall planting came to my mind. You know it's almost time to plant your bulbs, right? Your gladiolas, your tulips. Have you ever seen a tulip bulb? It's beautiful, isn't it? It's just a work of art, right? No, oh, it looks like a dirt clod in your hand. It looks like a, a, a worn out piece of garlic in your hand. And yet you take this ugly bulb and plant it in the ground, and what does it produce? It produces a beautiful flower. That flower was somewhere in that bulb, but you couldn't see it. As you and I think about what's going to happen when we die, Think about these bodies as those tulip bulbs. They're not much to look at. They don't do a whole lot of good. You're not going to put a tulip bulb on your piano and display it in your house or on your dining room table, but someday, in due time, it becomes a flower. Those first century Christians are thinking, that's what's going to happen to me. 
I am going to get a new body someday, and it's going to look and function like the resurrected Jesus Christ. That's a mouthful. All right, let's move on. Here you go. 45 and 46. Some good theology here. Let's think about this. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. So obviously God gave Adam life. He was the first one. The last Adam, and I I mentioned this, and if I could circle it, I would, the word last here, because it's going to be second in a moment. The the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. So he's drawing this amazing parallel between Adam and Jesus Christ. Jesus is the last Adam. He is exactly what God wanted Adam to be. And this creates an interesting situation for us. How do we live in the present knowing we've now got a glimpse of the the world to come? How do we live in the present knowing that someday we have these new bodies waiting for us? In my mind, what it says is be assured and have faith and have courage. There's no reason to live in fear. If you and I know our ultimate destination is to have these new bodies, why in the world would we obsess over these bodies we have right now? And yet, how many of us spend our days obsessing over these bodies? And of course, I would never suggest we neglect them. I was memorizing these notes doing a power walk yesterday morning in the rain. I mean, we do want to take care of these bodies. But I think the message here is that someday we're going to have a spiritual body, so don't obsess. There's a passage in the New Testament where we are told that we have the treasure of God's Holy Spirit inside of us as earthen vessels. So we have this earthen natural body and the Spirit lives inside of us. And I think most of us need to spend more time paying attention to the Spirit inside of us than worrying about the external. I mean, think about it in these terms. If you had, or I had, a beautiful piece of art and we wanted everyone to see this beautiful piece of art, And we went out and we bought a massive frame for it. And the frame had all kinds of jewels. It had twinkling lights. It had a strobe light. It had a horn on the frame. Everything to to draw your attention to it. What would you notice, the frame or the picture? We'd notice the frame. As we think about these bodies we're given, remember that they are earthen vessels, but we have the treasure inside of us. And so just a word, I think it's a great word of comfort, not to obsess over these bodies. Sometimes these bodies, they're not going to be healed. Paul got that. Remember what he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? He wrote about a thorn in the flesh. Paul was able to heal other people by the power of God. And guess what happened to Paul? God didn't heal him. And his conclusion was, sometimes God just doesn't. And it keeps me humble and it keeps me faithful. Remember, God doesn't work for us, we work for Him. All right, let's move on. We having fun yet? Okay, let's do it. 47 through 49. And I I didn't originally have this in my notes, and I don't know why I skipped over it, but I just, I want to mention something here. Remember in the last screen we looked at, Adam was the first man, Jesus was the last. In fact, what Jesus did, no one else is going to do. He came and died for our sins. However, here, the first man was of the dust, the second man of heaven. So he was the last when it came to being the one who would make us right with God, but he's the second one, which implies there'll be a third and a fourth and a fifth all the way up into the billions. He was, because we're all going to be there. It includes all of us. As was the earthly man, so are those of the earth. As is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. That's going to be us. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. He talks about what was and what will be. Have borne, will bear. And for me, the takeaway is, let's not live in fear of death. It's scary. It's the unknown. And we all deal with it in our own lives. But what he's saying is, eventually, we're going to bear the image of a heavenly man. And so we can trust God. And how does that change our lives? Just to know that we don't have to live in constant fear. You think of the birth of of a baby when he or she is in the womb as a fetus. That baby basically has all they need. It's 
comfortable in there. No one's bothering them. They have a nice little water bed they get to sleep in every day. No bright lights. Constant sound of mom's heartbeat. Constantly being fed. Everything is wonderful in that place. And then what happens, there is this violent act of birth. And then suddenly there's this entire new world. If you were to ask a fetus, if you could, where would you rather be? Here where you are, or in this huge world, the fetus would say, I'd rather stay where I am. It's familiar, it's comfortable to me. But if you ask those of us now, who've lived on this planet for a while, we'd say, absolutely, I want to live in this world with all its beauty, with all its opportunity. Whenever you and I fear death, I think often we're kind of like that fetus, saying, I know what I know, it's all right here, my needs are met, and what God is saying to us is, eventually, you've got an entirely new life. The other insight and the other kind of takeaway from this for you and me is not to burden ourselves or burden others with responsibility for their broken bodies, for their imperfections, for the fact that their bodies might not be what they should be or they want them to be or they used to be. You know, it's, it's tempting to do that. I mean, you, you know, you, you see people who have been through traumatic surgeries and, and you sometimes wonder, what have you done to cause this? The truth is, these bodies are in earthen vessels. Uh, several months ago, when I was at the hospital with one of our church members who has a, an extreme case of neuropathy and he's already lost one leg and possibly is going to lose the other leg, it's not his fault. He has neuropathy. And so it just kind of unburden ourselves with that. I remember when my son was diagnosed with a rare genetic dis disorder, a rare genetic syndrome. And, you know, you hear genetic and you're adopted, and then what do you think? It's my fault. And I dealt with shame and guilt. And then eventually you realize, it's not my fault. I think one of the beautiful things about this promise is God is saying, expect it. That's the way life is. But also understand, it's very, very short, and someday you're going to inherit this am amazing body. And so we make peace with these bodies. We don't feel guilty and we don't feel shame. We don't make other people feel guilty or shame. We don't spend our time fearing death because we know it's happening to all of us. Why do we need a new body? And I'm almost done, y'all. Why do we need a new body? Verse 50, here you go. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood, these bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These bodies aren't going to work there. Nor does the imperishable inherit the perishable. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. I'm sorry about that, y'all. In other words, it's going to take new bodies where we're going. These aren't going to work. You know, there are going to be sights in heaven that these eyes, they can't take. There are going to be experiences that these bodies can't handle. There are going to be wonderful smells that these noses, they can't possibly process. You may think about it like this. You know, one of my, I think one of the, the greatest foods ever invented was the cheese coney at Skyline Chili. The cheese coney at Skyline Chili is brilliant. Rodney, are you hiding back there from me? You are, there you are, making sure. Think about how brilliant the cheese coney is. I mean, I remember the first time I had one, I thought, this is the greatest thing in the world. I mean, it's the perfect mix of the soft steamed bun and the hot dog and the spicy chili and the bun's a little sweet and then the cheese is cold on top of that. It's just marvelous. You know what? An infant couldn't eat one. An infant couldn't handle it. Especially if you line it with like Tabasco sauce right down the edge of the bun, you know? <laughs> Infants, they can't possibly process that. You and I are going to a place these bodies can't handle it. It is too good for these bodies. We are not equipped. We are not enabled in any way, physically as we are today, to handle where we're going tomorrow or in the, or in the future. And that's what Paul wants us to know, that we are going to need a better body, a body that is not sown in dishonor, a body that is not perishable, a body that is not weak. A body that is not in any way dishonored or natural. No. We're going to need something new. And so those first century Christians, 
They're thinking, what's going to happen to me when I die? And Paul says, remember this, don't be afraid of that. And don't obsess over these bodies and over this life. And don't in any way feel shame or guilt or make others feel shame or guilt for the condition of their bodies because someday these bodies are going to be gone and you're going to get a new one. One of the ways that we know this to be true is from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I'd like to invite those of you who are at home to get your elements together and those of you who are here as well. And what we'll do is after I do the words of institution, we will all take both the bread and the cup together. You know, before we get started, we are taught that people are going to come from east and west and north and south, and they're going to sit at a table at a banquet and enjoy that together. And we believe that these spiritual bodies are going to experience something that we have never experienced. Amazing communion with God and with one another, and amazing food that God's going to provide for us that smells and tastes even better than a Skyline cheese cone, right? And so what I'd like to do now is invite you just to spend a few moments in prayer with me as we prepare our hearts. We'll confess our sins to God. Let's pray together. <clears throat> our gracious God, we give you thanks again for this holy meal and for all that it represents. We thank you that you call us here from different backgrounds and that you remind us that this table does not belong to any church or denomination. It belongs solely to you and you bring your people as invited guests. As we, prepare, as we prepare for this meal, we pray, Lord God, that you remind us that you know our form, that we are dust as we read from the psalm. And so hear us now as we confess our sins to you, Lord. We thank you, God, that you understand us and that you know us. You know our form and you know our frame. But you are also our Father in heaven who has compassion. And so accept our gratitude that you have forgiven our sins in your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Will you remember, friends, that on the night he was with his disciples for the Passover feast, he established a new covenant. He said, this feast now, the Passover, has new meaning for you. And so he took the bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, it's broken for you, and when you do this, remember me. And then in the same manner, he took the cup. And he poured it out and said, This cup is the new covenant, it is sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins, so all of you drink of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. So friends, these are the gifts of God for you and me, the people of God. Let's enjoy them together. Let's continue in prayer. Our gracious God, again we bow before You. And we thank You for the amazing promises we have read this morning. That someday we will indeed inherit new bodies, spiritual bodies, where we together will eat at Your table. Where we will recognize one another and communicate with one another. Bodies where we can praise You and serve You in various ways. We thank You that You will give us bodies that will no longer be natural bodies. Bodies that aren't sown in dishonor. And bodies that are not weak. And so we pray that You give us a fresh look at life today, understanding that it is merely a foretaste of life in the future. Lord, we pray for this church and thank You for it. We pray for this country, for those who are traveling this weekend, so many of them. We pray for our leaders. We pray for your world, and we see the brokenness, the famine, the hunger, the natural disasters, wars that are happening in places like the Ukraine, 
We lift it all to You and we pray that by Your Holy Spirit, Your church will be responsive and alive and active and more and more men and women will come to know You and Your good news. And so, Lord God, we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand for the Lord's Prayer, please? Remember, you can spend some time together over in Gathering Grounds enjoying some refreshments. And also, if you've got tech questions, they're waiting for you out in the lobby to help you out with all those different platforms. But for now, go in peace. And go in the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you today and forever. Amen.